Richard with ev for You Custom Conversions, and welcome to another episode of how to convert your car from gas to electric. Well, in the last two episodes, we talked about batteries. So let me ask you, what's the purpose of the batteries? Well, the purpose of the battery pack is to provide power for the motor. What's the purpose of the motor? Well, it's to turn the wheels. So in this episode, we're going to talk about motors as well as controllers. So what I have here is a net gain warp 9 series wound DC motor. At one time, probably one of the most popular motors used in conversions. This has the capability of putting out almost 200 horsepower with the right battery pack and controller combination. So there was a time when DC pretty much ruled. If we go back and look kind of the history of the conversion, we find that the early conversions used lead acid batteries and DC motors and controllers. Then, about 2008, 2009, we went to lithium batteries and DC motors. And then, a few years after that, it was lithium batteries and AC motors. That's kind of just been the way things have gone. One, because of availability, and the other because of what is uh, desirable. And so we're going to talk about motors, and we're going to talk about the three common motor options for those who want to convert their car from gas to electric. So one of the types is this series wound DC motor, such as this net gain motor. Another type is an AC motor, and common in conversions are a three-phase AC induction motor. And then what I'm labeling as the third type is what we're going to call the OEMs. That's original equipment manufacturers. That's motors that you'd be able to get out of a manufactured vehicle such as a Nissan Leaf, a Chevy Volt, a uh, Fiat 500E, and, uh, and the likes. So let's talk a little bit about each of those different Let's talk types. about those three types that we mentioned. We'll start with DC. DC was, was popular originally with converters mainly because of, of availability. There just weren't any good low voltage uh, AC offerings out there. And the reason I say low voltage is when you were dealing with lead acid batteries, it was hard to have a high voltage setup. It just required too many batteries, which took up too much volume and you know too much weight. So most systems were in the you know uh, 144 volt uh, area, and so uh, maybe 168 volts on the top end, and so. Uh, the DCs were available and they were inexpensive. And so today, when we look at a DC, what, what, what do we, you know, because these others are, are now available, so it's, it's not just one offering. Well, the DC offers high torque and low cost. Two big advantages of the DC to this day. Now, the AC, well, the biggest thing that most people think of is regenerative braking. That's a big one. The DC, when you let off the throttle, it free wheels. There, there is no hold back. And the regenerative braking does put some energy back 
into your battery pack. But it's been shown in testing that you actually get more range by coasting than you do with, with regenerative braking. And that's something for another time. For instance, if you take one of our workshops. But the big thing regenerative braking does is it gives you, it replicates that internal combustion field. It gives you that, that hold back. But, so that's one benefit of the AC. Another is that they tend to be lighter. And remember, in our last couple episodes, we talked about how important weight is. So a motor that is lighter, that's a plus. They also tend to run cooler. And that's because it's an induction motor and it doesn't have this commutator that has uh, some resistance in that connection there. It also has friction. And so the combination of resistance and friction equates heat. And so as we're you know, driving the car, we're generating some heat. And basically the motor, um, most of them are rated basically on their ability to dissipate heat. You know, uh, how much heat can that motor dissipate in a given period of time? And so they inherently run cooler. That's a positive. Now I'm going to break the AC into two, uh, two camps here. One is going to be uh, low voltage. And the low voltage, that's going to be up to uh, like 170 volts max. And that's going to be for systems like the very popular high performance electric vehicle systems. And they're basically from like 96 volts up to 170. That's what I would classify as a low voltage AC system. And then we have the OEMs. These are the original equipment manufactured motors that you would find in a Chevy Volt, a Nissan Leaf, a Fiat 500E, um, you know, the Volkswagen electric golf, so forth. Uh, the electric version of the Kia Soul. Don't mean to leave anybody out, there's just getting to be a lot of them. And of course, Tesla. So these tend to be high voltage, and they tend to run anywhere from 280 to over. Oops. To over 400 volts. Now, the advantage of the higher voltage is, is greater efficiencies as well as smaller cabling. Now, we talked about Ohm's Law in a previous episode. So remember, Ohm's Law says that volts times amps equals watts. So volts times amps equals power. So if we have a motor that's putting out the same amount of power, but the volts are greater, the amps will be lower for the same power rating. Make sense? So the OEMs, basically, they're a higher voltage. Lower current. Now, that doesn't mean that they can't pull high currents. Tesla would be a perfect example. They can pull a lot of current in their setup. But typically, you're, you're going to run in your conversion. If you do a higher voltage setup, you're typically going to be able to get away with smaller amp hour batteries and smaller cabling because you're going to run less current to achieve the same amount of power out.
So what are other, some of the other benefits of going with the OEM? Well, one is that they're typically liquid cooled. And so that's an important thing. One of the problems that we've seen historically was the DC's motors, like I said, they ran hotter. And when you're going short distances, that wasn't a problem. They were able to dissipate that amount of heat that was created in that amount of time. And so they, that was doable. But when we start coming out with longer range uh, conversions, well now suddenly that heat becomes a problem. Driving the DC motor for 20 minutes was one scenario. When you're driving it for an hour, that's a whole other ball game and you start having heat issues. And so the AC ran cooler, but again, it's not the same creature as an OEM that was designed to be idiot proof, to handle, you know, any scenario. I mean, they have to make a vehicle and components that will handle anything you, you throw at it. Whereas when you're doing a conversion, you know, you're going to make it to handle what you, you know, anticipate. And in our test vehicle, our, our Volkswagen Carmen Ghia, we've tested these two. And we found that uh, on, you know, the shorter range capability, the 60 mile range car, that DC could do it with auxiliary cooling. We never had a problem with the net gain motors that we tested. tested. And we found that the high performance electric vehicle systems, their AC motors run a little cooler, but not a huge amount cooler than the DC with cooling did. But the OEM motor with liquid cooling is going to come in better than all of them. And that also gives you longevity. The cooler they run, the longer they're going to run. So big advantage. Another advantage is that you'll be able to source those from wrecking yards to a dealership. And so availability is going to be a big plus. Instead of only having one supplier or a couple of suppliers, you're going to have lots of suppliers. Another uh, issue, I guess, with this is that where these were basically plug and play, this isn't quite yet. Now, there are people out there that are designing interfaces that will allow you to communicate with these uh, CAN-controlled OEM motors. But they're kind of one-off kind of uh, uh, scenario still, and it's not, you know, a buy-it-off-the-shelf item like the motor might be. And so that's one shortcoming at this time, and that's at this time. This all changes pretty rapidly. We've seen a lot of changes since 2008 when we started doing this. So anyway, those are your three basic motor options as of January 2017. So which motor are you going to use? Well, it comes down to the weight of the vehicle. In other words, you're not going to put a Fiat 500e motor in a big four-wheel drive pickup truck. It wasn't designed for a vehicle of that weight and, and load. And so weight of the vehicle, the load on the vehicle. So if you're going to be hauling a trailer or something, you know, that would be a different issue. Uh, the cargo, passengers, so forth. So the use, what's the intent? Are you going to be drag racing? Are you going to be, you know, just commuting? And then size. The motor has to fit in the engine compartment. And so, you know, there are, you think, well, you know, electric motor is small compared to the gasoline engine. 
Well, that's true, but there still are size considerations, especially for front engine transverse mounted uh, vehicles. There's typically a length issue there. Uh, you can also have length issues with some cars because of uh, cross members in the vehicle, um, steering components, uh, rack and pinion steering uh, can be a limitation in some vehicles and where the motor might be, you know, diameter wise and linearly be where it's going to have some interference where the gasoline engine, you know, there was um, a, you know, distortion in the oil pan or whatever allowed for clearances and so forth. So, so clearance and size is a consideration. The use, the load, and the weight of the vehicle, all going to be considerations when selecting a motor. So bottom line is your motor needs to be compatible with the vehicle, the load, the range, and performance requirements. Now let's talk about controllers. Well, again, there's going to be some different types. In general, we're going to have DC controllers and AC inverters, uh, which are also typically called controllers, even though technically it's an inverter, but they call them controllers because it's what's controlling the motor. Now, the DC ones were less selective. In other words, you could have a uh, AMD uh, manufactured a DC motor, you have a net gain manufactured DC motor, and those could use any DC controller. It, it, it didn't matter. You could use um, uh, a Curtis, you could use a, a Zilla, you could use an Evnetics. Um, and there's a few others that were popular at one time that I'm drawing a blank right now. But any of those would work with any of the DC motors. But when we get to the AC, the AC is picky. The AC, instead of it just uh, regulating uh, the current through the motor, it needs to communicate with that motor so that it knows where it is. There's an encoder in the AC motor that lets the controller know where it is in that 360 degrees of rotation. And so they need to be compatible that they can uh, be able to communicate. And so a little more particular when you're talking about AC controllers, you, you want two that are compatible with one another. And then again, your AC controller will need to be compatible with the motor, the vehicle, the intended use, so forth. And most of your uh, OEM stuff, as a matter of fact, all of it that I'm aware of, will be liquid cooled. Now, the uh, ones that are used with the high performance electric vehicle systems motors, they use Curtis controllers. And the Curtis controllers they use are air cooled. They have a heat sink on the bottom and they're designed to be air cooled. However, several places, including EV for You, make a chill plate that helps wick away that heat and allows these things to operate uh, better than they would with just air cooling, with just a regular thin heat sink. And so we've shown that in, in, in other videos, if you look at, we started off originally with a Curtis 1231C, very popular controller uh, in the earlier days, air cooled. We added liquid cooling to that, but too little, too late, it died. Then we went to an Evnetics and about the same size controller, because we were trying to do an equal comparison, we went with this basically a 500 amp controller. The difference was that the Curtis, because it was air-cooled, it was 500 amps, but only for two minutes. And then 
it would basically have to back off power to maintain uh, cooling, keep it from overheating. Where the Fnetics was rated at 500 amps continuous because it was liquid cooled. However, the liquid cooling wasn't sufficient. Their uh, water volume that would go through that controller wasn't sufficient, especially in the testing environment that we tested in, where we have uh, freeway speeds, uh, terrain, hilly terrain, and high ambient temperatures. And so it didn't last any longer than the air-cooled Curtis did. And so uh, we're currently testing, and it's been over a year um, that we've, and we've gone through one summer season of testing the high-performance electric vehicle systems uh, motor with a Curtis uh, AC controller that has a custom-made chill plate but it's using the same cooling system on the car side. We have the same pump, same radiators, and so forth. And it has been running nice and, and cool. We've never been even close to its uh, threshold where it goes into thermal cutback. So very pleased with that performance. So if you get a setup like that, the AC systems for the uh, uh, heavier vehicles, for the heavier use uh, vehicle, that's the way to go. And of course, the OEM is going to be the ultimate in design as far as uh, being able to handle uh, the cooling and the loads and so forth. If you buy one that's compatible with your vehicle of choice. Again, you get one for a car like the uh, Fiat 500e, which is a small vehicle, it's not going to power your Cadillac Escalade for very long. So hopefully I've made the point that cooling is important for both motors and controllers, especially for heavier vehicles and uh, heavier loads and longer range. So let's look at a AC uh, and a DC motor and controller setup. What we have here is a DC setup. And so here's our DC motor, and there's our controller. Now the power comes in over here from our battery pack, goes through a contactor, and then goes to the controller and to the motor. So here's our positive coming into the motor. It goes through the armature windings, comes out and goes through our stator windings, and then comes out and goes back through our controller and back to our negative um, side of the battery pack. So this is a series one DC motor as I just showed. It's air cooled as well as this controller is air cooled. This piece back here is a combination heat sink and mounting board here is an example of an AC setup. This is a three-phase AC induction motor, and here's our inverter. So here, again, this is the power coming from the battery pack, goes through a contactor, goes to our inverter, and this is the return line back to the battery pack. The inverter inverts this to three phase AC. Now you can see that this motor is also air cooled. Both motors were drawing air in from this end and expelling it out that end using an internal fan. This controller is from the factory air cooled. Again it has a heat sink right here and Let's get another uh, view of that, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Okay, so here's our inverter. This is the base of the inverter, this shiny surface here. And that's a heat sink. And that's how they would cool themselves. You can attach a thin heat sink to this or some other setup. 
but we have this piece right here, which is a chill plate. It has water galleys in there that wick the heat away. From so this episode's recommendation, well, a little, little commercial, I guess. In this week's episode, I recommend that you attend one of our three-day hands-on conversion workshops. Because in this video series, we're just, you know, skimming the surface. In the workshops, we go in depth, we answer all of your questions. You're in an environment where you have other people with other backgrounds. And so they ask questions you never think to ask. And so you learn more in that three days. It's an intense three days, let me tell you. We've been doing these for years now. And I learn something every time. We have people from all different backgrounds from all over the world. And it is a very good time and a very educational time. And the workshops are designed in such a way that you're not just exposed to this, but what you are exposed to, what you learn is reinforced so that six months, 18 months after the fact, you will still be able to retain most of the information. Plus we give you a book and a binder with reference material and so forth. You, you walk away with quite the resource. So what's in store next week? Well, next week, like I said, the, the, the batteries provide the power for the motor and the motor turns the wheels. Well, not exactly. We need to be able to mate the motor to the transmission or to a differential or however your setup's gonna be, but we, we need to have a, an adapter and a coupler and mounting. And so we're going to talk about adapters, couplers, and motor mounts next Wednesday. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you then.